This conference will now be recorded. This is part two of who is the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Last word, uh, last week actually, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's amazing how much scripture there is on this topic. We learned that Jesus Christ is God as according to his own words, according to his holy prophets and apostles in the scripture. He is God in the Old Testament. He is God in the New Testament. He has always been God, he is God, and he always will be God. That is unchangeable. We saw last week that he was our God in Isaiah chapter 40 of the Old Testament. He's the mighty God of Isaiah chapter nine in the Old Testament. He is the one that the Father refers to as O God in Psalm 45 of the Old Testament. He is God manifest in the flesh in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He is with God, but also is God and the Word in John chapter 1. He is God in Hebrews chapter 1. And there are so many of these passages that prove what he is. What we learn that is in all. We learned obviously that God is made up of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's also the Word, and the Holy Spirit. All three are one. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, they are all part of one God, but there are different parts to God. And we learned the part of God that created the heavens and the earth. Oh, yes, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God the Son. He's the God creator that made the trillions of stars, that made every animal and plant and bird and fish and whale and creature of every kind. There was nothing made that was not made by him. He's the maker, we learned. You can read about that in the book of Hebrews, that he made the worlds plural. You can read about that in Colossians 1, verse 16. All things are made by him and for him. You can read about that in John chapter 1. Oh, yes, he's the maker, God, creator. He's there in the first chapter of the Bible, in the first verse, speaking the world into existence in the heavens. He's there in the last book of the Bible, the last verse of the Bible. We learn he was God the judge. He is God that is going to judge everyone that ever lived. That's the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. Everyone that you read about in the book of Revelations and elsewhere, he's gonna be sitting on the throne and judging every single human being. They're gonna stand before almighty God, God the Son, and he's gonna judge them according to their works. We also learned he is the Lord God of Israel. He is the I am that Moses asked him what his name was. What should Moses tell the children of Israel about the name of God? Who is he? God told him that his name was I am that I am. We read in John chapter eight, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Before Abraham was, I am. And then they set out to kill him because he was making himself into God. He didn't need to make himself into God. They thought he was making himself into God. He didn't need to make himself into God. He was telling the truth because he was God. Oh, he said that he was the Lord. There's no doubt about that. And then he has many other names we learned about him. He is the beginning. 
He is the end. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He is the first. He is the last. He is everlasting life. According to 1 John, that is his name. He is the source of immortality. He is light. He is life. It's so all encompassing because God is all encompassing, encompassing. God is infinite and the spectrum of the definition of God is infinite. And because he's a part of God and is God and was God and always will be God, it's an infinite definition for him. An infinite definition. And it is, it's a remarkable definition for him. Understanding all of that, though, with all of that background of who God is and who God the Son is, who the Word is, who the Lord Jesus Christ is, getting all that background down about him being God the Creator, God the Judge, the Lord God of Israel, then it's even more magnificent to know that he became a man, that he was also a man, that God was manifest in the flesh. First Timothy chapter one, verse 16, that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, John chapter one. Oh, all of that God became a man. And he was a man as well as being God. And what kind of man was he? You could read about him in the Old Testament. You could read about him in the New Testament. You could read about him prophetically and you could see the fulfillment of what kind of man this man was when God became a man. Why don't we get a little handle on that? I spoke about this last week. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, let's turn back to Isaiah chapter 53. Why don't we start in verse 2? For he shall grow up before him. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, just like you do in John 1, just like you do in Genesis when he's creating man. He's saying, let us create man in our image, plural, the different parts of God. Just like in John 1, you have him in the beginning was the word. That's the name of Jesus Christ, one of his many names. And the word was with God, so he is with God. And the word was God, so he's with God and he is God. Well, here he is in his earthly incarnation. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness. This is an archaic definition to form and comeliness. It means an attractive, beautiful, or handsome person. Both form means beauty and attractiveness, like we would say, say well, he has a beautiful stature. He has very fine features. Comeliness is the same thing. It's beauty, it's handsomeness. Oh, he didn't have any of, any of that when he walked around on the ground of this earth. He was not attractive. He was not handsome. Spoke about that last week. He's contrary to all these paintings and ridiculous pictures of him that the Christian and the non-Christian world presents. He had no form, no comeliness. And when we saw him, there was no beauty that we should desire him. You would not desire him and want him to be part of your uh, attractive club of, you know, attractive friends. No, he was not. He was nothing like that. You would not desire him. But what else was he? He was despised in verse three. This is the kind of man. This is what he was like. Bear in mind, before he was born, Satan tried to kill him and tried to kill everybody and killed all the children from where he was supposed to be born. 
that were two and under. He used man as his instrument. So from the minute he was born, he was he was a person that was it was a uh, trying to be killed by Satan as a little baby. But he was despised and rejected of men. It was not a walk in the park being the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here. He was tempted at all points. He was harassed by people. He was rejected by his own family. He was rejected by his friends. He was despised and rejected of men. Keep in mind, his own familiar friend, Judas Iscariot, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver and stabbed him in the back. That's what kind of a man he was. Keep in mind his other friend, Peter, the night that he was taken and crucified, denied him three times and cursed and said he didn't even know who he was. Even though Peter earlier that day had told Christ that he would die with him, he would never deny him. No, all of them, all of these apostles, all people were offended by him that night that he was taken. Despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. How did humanity treat him? How did his apostles and all those followers of his treat him? Oh, they hid their faces from him. It's the kind of man he was. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. It was like, no, I don't even want to be associated with him. I'm not even going to look upon him. Again, it says the second time he was despised and we esteemed him not. Keep in mind, this is the kind of man he was. He came onto his own, Israel, and his own received him not. He made Israel. He made the nation Israel. He was their God. And they didn't receive him, with some exceptions. The Bible says he came onto his own, and his own received him not. That's the kind of man he was. In the book of John, we re read in John chapter 1, that he made the world, and the world knew him not. The very world he made, they knew him not. It's amazing if you think about it, that you're God, you made the world, you made the heavens, you made the stars, and you come and you per foretell where you're gonna be born before you're born in Bethlehem, when you're gonna come through Daniel, when you're gonna die through Daniel, how you're gonna die, what is gonna happen to you, where, you're, how you're going to manifest yourself through donkey, coming to Jerusalem in a donkey and a baby donkey. Every little detail about yourself you foretell so that they will know who you are when you get there. But they didn't know who he was. They were blind to him. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own received him not. That's the kind of man he was. Go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, please. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee in verse 32. Peter answered and said unto him in verse 33, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I not, I'm sorry, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Well, we know what happened. Peter denied him three times, cursed, and said he never knew him. All of them were offended in him that night. And by the way, everybody was offended in him in one way or another in regards to the cross and his humiliation before the cross and his beatings and all the things that happened to him. That's the kind of man he was. That's the kind of things... These are the kinds of things that he suffered. 
But there's something else that we've got to really think about when we think about him dying on the cross. We think about him as God. And we think that how marvelous this is to understand what an aston astonishing miracle that God, the creator, judge, the God of Israel would actually come to the earth and die on a cross for us. If that was a prophet dying on that cross, or if that was some holy man, or that was somebody that was going to start a religion, should we even care? If it was a prophet of God dying for us, what does it matter? They have their own sins. Why would we care about him as a normal man dying on a cross? But once you understand that it is God dying on that cross for you, the one who made the heavens is dying for you, the one that will judge everyone that ever lived is dying for you. God Almighty, that makes all the difference in the world. When you know that background about who the biblical Jesus Christ is, how much more miraculous is it that he not only became a man, but also was willing to die for you? And why was he willing to die for you? Why was he willing to die for you? Well, he wanted you to have eternal life. He needed to pay for your sins. And why did he need to pay for sins? Because as God, the judge, dying on that cross, he knows everything. And he knows that he is a God that requires evil to be paid for. He is a just judge. And the Bible indicates he will in no wise clear the guilty. The evil of mankind must be paid for by a just God. And God is not a God that looks the other way when evil is committed. No, every deed the Bible indicates that they're treasuring up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who according to Romans chapter two, will render to every man according to his deeds. So the evil you have committed and I have committed in using the name of the Lord in vain by saying in a non-reverential way, oh my God, why do we say that? That is what the Bible says. If you use his name in vain, you are, he will not hold you guiltless who uses his name in vain. Yes, I hear Christians say that all the time. Stop saying that because that's a crime against God. And that's an evil thing to do. But all the other crimes against God, all the other evil things, crimes against man, crimes against God, evil deeds, that has to be paid for. God of righteousness and holiness and a just judge will do that. Some people don't want to just judge. They want evil to be unpunished and evil to flourish and just continue. That's not the nature of God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is the great thing about what he did. He paid for your evil when he died on the cross. He paid for your crimes against him. He paid for your crimes against man. He paid for your sins. That's why the God of the universe came and died for you, so that he could be just because he paid the penalty himself. And he could be the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus, Romans chapter 3. He could be just because the sinless God Almighty paid for those crimes by dying a hideous death. But he can also be the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus because he reckoned your old person of sin was dying there with him. He reckoned, he planted you on that cross with him. 
your old person of sin was dying with him. Why? It wasn't his sins that were being paid for in the justice system of God. It was your sins that are being paid for in the justice system of God. So the Jesus Christ of the Bible, Almighty God, had your crimes paid for in his criminal justice system. And then what he did is he created the dispensation of the grace of God. He created the gospel of the grace of God to fit in that dispensation of the grace of God. He revealed it to Paul and he gave you a message. I give you eternal life for free. You just believe the gospel and your sins are paid for when you believe that gospel and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit and you're going to be raised immortal, eternal and rule and reign with me forever. Very simple message. But that's what the Jesus Christ of the Bible did. The God Almighty of the Bible came down here, became a man to die for you and me. God died for us. There's no other way around it. And that makes all the difference in the world when you think about it, that it is God Almighty dying for your sins on the cross. It's not a mortal of any sort. It's not even just some special prophet or holy person. No, this is God Almighty who's paying for your sins. I wanted to add something else, which I didn't about G the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And that is, <clears throat> he became a man just like us. But the difference is, he was tempted in all points, but he never sinned. Turn to Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. And I think that's important to be aware of that everything we suffer, he suffered, but far, far worse. His sufferings were far worse. Uh, he was besieged and tormented by satanic forces when he was in the womb and all the way through his life. Verse 14, he's a high priest of Israel, by the way, in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest. He is not the high priest to the church, the body of Christ. The priesthood is never mentioned once in Romans through Philemon. You are not a priesthood. Disabuse yourself of that notion. You are the church, which is his body. This is associated with Israel. Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. It wasn't written to the church, which is his body. It's another name for him. He's their great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, and that's another name for him. He is the son of God, and we'll discuss that later. <clears throat> Let us hold fast our profession. I think that has to do with the nation of priests and kings. They have a profession, just like I'm an attorney. They're a nation of priests and they're a nation of kings. They're defined that way in the Old Testament. They're defined that way in the New Testament. And God has not abrogated all his promises and his covenants with Israel. Every one of them will be fulfilled in the future. They will be the nation of God Almighty. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. No, of course not. Why? Because he lived as a man, just like we do. He suffered just like we do. And look at this, but was in all points tempted like as we are. But here's a major difference. Here is the major difference. Yet without sin, all points tempted as we are, Yet without sin, he never sinned. And I'm not going to get into in detail the Jesus Christ of the Bible and what he suffered on the cross. When he went to the cross, before he was in the cross, he was beaten and so marred. He was so abused that when he was on the cross, the Bible describes him, his stomach, uh, his heart fell down into his stomach. All his bones were out of joint. You could not tell it was a human being on there. He looked like a worm or a piece of meat. He was beaten so badly and abused so badly. It was a hideous sight. Nothing like the crucifixion that Rembrandt painted. Nothing like any of those ridiculous paintings and pictures of the cross. You can even tell it was a man up there. 
The Bible describes the crucifixion and the hideousness of it in great detail. And when he was up there, did he get any comfort from anybody there? No, he didn't. They gaped upon him with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. They were unsympathetic. They were heartless. They were mocking him. Except for one man. Oh, there was a man there that told him to remember me, the one being crucified right next to him. Remember me when you get into your kingdom. And Christ told him, this day shall you be with me in paradise. And that's my paraphrase, but that's what he told him. Basically, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. The other one gnashed on him with his teeth as the one thief did. And I'm sure there were people there that were sympathetic to him. There were people there that cared about him. But the big picture you get is all of humanity is against him when he's there in being tortured and horribly beaten and marred just beyond recognition as a human being. When his heart is sinking down into his bowels and every uh, bone is out of joint, uh, the horrible things that he suffered. Now, I want to dis discuss something about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is that, I mean, you realize it, that God is dying for your sins and my sins. Think about it this way. Turn to Acts chapter 20. See the blood being shed there. People get influenced by horrible teachings where, oh, he really wasn't God. No, he, you know, how could God not know the day of his return and all that? And they ignored the vast tracts of the scriptures. You go to Acts chapter 20, verse 25. Let me tell you what the Bible teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ, that when he was shedding his blood, this is the blood of God Almighty. Look at verse 25. This is the Apostle Paul. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. And that's the church, which is the body of Christ, which he had purchased with his own blood. With his own blood. Whose blood is that? The blood of God. Who is that? The biblical Lord Jesus, God himself. What is the church of God? It's a church which is a body of Christ. How did he purchase God? How did God purchase the church with his own blood? By dying for the church and shedding his blood on the cross. Verse 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Beware of those they call church fathers that are not apostles or prophets of God, but they look for those people to teach them about God, extra biblical teachings, beware of them. When Paul was there, Paul warned them. Then when Paul departed, grievous wolves will enter among those people Paul taught, not sparing the flock. He already warned about those people in Galatians. In fact, they already had come in to the Galatians. And Paul said, the Galatians were foolish. Who has bewitched them? That they would not believe the truth. And Paul wished that those people that came in and taught false doctrines to the Galatians were actually cut off and killed off. He didn't like them at all. They were liars and they came to try to put them under bondage to religion. Verse 32, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an, an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Why don't we turn to, um, while well, we're in the book of Acts, actually, let's go to Titus chapter two. 
See, he's purchasing it with his own blood. So I just brought up a few verses that show that Jesus Christ is God. I didn't cover that many of them. There are so many of these verses, uh, like Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I know if you believe the word of God, you should find one verse showing his God and you should be willing to believe that. But I understand that people want to see it repeated. They want to see God teaching it in other places. They want to see that they haven't misinterpreted it. But you cannot misinterpret the fact that Jesus is God in the scriptures unless you don't want to believe it. If you don't want to believe it and you make that choice, like a lot of Christians do, they're often ignorant. They're part of the great denomination, the greatest Christian denomination as far as numbers. They are called ignorant brethren. They are easily the greatest denomination. They know very little about the Bible. They know very little about the gospel, the grace of God. They're following along with their religions. And there are a lot of them that are trained in seminary. I'm talking about people that go to seminary. I've debated informally lots of these people, They're tremendously ignorant people. And I'm talking about pastors and teachers and preachers. Here he is again. Oh, we're waiting for that appearance. Yes, we are. It's our blessed hope of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. The great God gave himself for us. See, it's the great God that forgave our sins. It's a great God that gave that uh, gospel to Paul. It's a great God that created the dispensation of the grace of God. It's a great God that raised us up together with him above everything and put us in that exalted position that we find ourselves in, in the book of Ephesians. Let's turn to one more. Let's turn to John chapter 20. And I find this passage amazing because a lot of people will say, well, Jesus never said he's God. We proved that false last week. He acknowledged he was Lord and I am. But here's another passage which really proves Jesus Christ is God and he's, when he's dealing with his apostles. John chapter 20, verse 24. Please turn to John chapter 20, verse 24. Thomas did not believe that he was raised from the dead. And Thomas was one of the 12 apostles. So verse 24, and by the way, when people with eyewitnesses came to the apostles, the 12, and came to them and said that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, they didn't believe it. That was not part of their gospel. They were not preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the death on the cross for people's sins. That was not part of the gospel of the kingdom. They were going on uh, proclaiming that. And when people said he was raised from the dead, they didn't believe it. And when Christ told them he was going to die, they fought against it like Peter did. And Peter was rebuked by Christ and Christ identified him as Satan or being influenced by Satan and told him to get behind me, Satan, in, in reference to Peter. So these men were not going around preaching, Christ is gonna die for your sins and be raised from the dead Back then, before he died and was raised from the dead, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, find one single place where they're preaching the resurrection and death of Christ for people's sins before he died on the cross. No, they didn't even believe he was raised from the dead. Eyewitnesses came to Peter and said it, and they didn't believe it. Thomas was one of those. Thomas even had other apostles coming forth to him and saying, we have observed Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Did Thomas believe it as one of the 12? Well, surely he did. He saw all the miracles. Oh, he did not believe it. Listen to what Thomas says. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple, disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, this is what Thomas is telling the other disciples that are eyewitnesses of seeing the resurrected Jesus Christ. 
So Thomas would not be a believer of the gospel grace because he would not have been a person that believed that Jesus was raised from the dead at this time. He is not just like Peter didn't believe that when an eyewitness came to Peter. We have seen the Lord eyewitnesses that Thomas knew that were disciples of Jesus Christ. But this is how Thomas dealt with it. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. No, he has to put his hands in there. He has to put his hands in the piercing of the hands that Psalm chapter uh, in the book of Psalms, the 22nd Psalm predicted that his hands would, they pierce his hands and his feet. And here, Thomas doesn't believe it unless he puts his hand, he puts, he has to see the hands with the nail prints in them. And he has to put his finger into the prints of the nails. And he has to thrust his hand in, into his side or he will not believe. Why will he not? Why is he thrusting it? Why does he want to thrust his hand into his side? That's because he took a spear and plunged it into his side is what they did. That's why he wants to put his hand in the wound that occurred to Jesus Christ when he was on the cross, when they thrust a spear into his side. He said, I won't believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, and this is a great scene, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now Thomas, is a changed man and he says something here that the lord fully accepted because it was true and thomas answered and said unto him my lord and my god now if jesus wasn't god here's jesus's turn oh, by the way lord in the context of jesus christ means god i lost count of how many times in the new testament he was called the Lord. There's so many of them that I just gave up. It's just, I wanted to count them all. I was like, I don't know what it was, but once I got into over a hundred, I said, okay, I'm just not gonna count this anymore. All the times he was referred to as Lord, meaning God, as the Lord Jesus Christ. But Thomas refers to him as my Lord and my God. Now's the time for Jesus to say, oh no, I'm not God, that's a father. But Jesus doesn't say that to him. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Believe what? Oh, yes, that he's my Lord and my God, and that I was raised from the dead. Oh, you see me, now you believe, okay? Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. We haven't seen him raised from the dead. We never saw him walk the earth. We never saw him do the miracles. We read God's word and that was enough of it for us. We read God's word and we believe God's word. That was enough of it for us. Now I have to add this about him. Okay, he became a man. Why don't we turn to Acts chapter 13? He was the son of God. He was the son of God in two ways. God Almighty defines him as the day that he begot him in Acts chapter 13. Let's start in verse 31. He was the son of God because he was born from the dead. That is from the Old Testament prophecy. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is, a, this is from the second Psalm. What is the day that he begot him? Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead. That's another name for him, the first begotten of the Father. How was he the first begotten of the Father? Was he born from God from a 
spiritual mother in the sky, like some of the Mormons claim in their doctrine, that he had a, a mother that procreated with God the Father and created uh, God the Son and also created Satan. And they were dueling forces, Satan, born of some spiritual mother that God the Father procreated with. No, I know that's not true at all. There's no biblical evidence of that. In fact, the Bible goes against that. No, he was the firstborn from the dead. He was born. The father born him when the father raised him from the dead. We know who raised him from the dead. We studied that last time. We studied that in the past. God, the father raised him from the dead. Who raised him from the dead? He was the firstborn from the dead. He was therefore the son of God because he was the firstborn from the dead. See, people don't understand that. They say, oh, he's the son of God. He was a, he was a, uh, a creature that was created. Oh yes, he was the firstborn from the dead, a, a part of God's creation, never to die again. Other people were raised from the dead, but then they die, like Lazarus, like his tomb says. Something about Lazarus, twice dead, friend of God. Yeah, they were raised from the dead and then they died. People say Elijah taken up in a whirlwind. Oh yes, Elijah's gonna come back to this earth and he's gonna die, by the way. The Antichrist is gonna kill him. But he is first born from the dead where he actually died. Unlike Enoch was just taken up, he didn't die. Jesus Christ died and was born from the dead by the father let's look at verse 31 and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from galilee to jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers god had fulfilled what was that promise that he made unto the fathers we'll read on you're going to find in the second psalm God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Well, what was the day he begot him? Begotten means born. What, is, what does that mean? Well, when he raised him from the dead, he begot him from the dead. He was a firstborn from the dead. He's the son of God. Because God, God born him, born him from the dead, raised him from the dead. He was born from the dead, born again, as they say. So read this carefully again, verse 33. God had fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he had raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That was the day he was raised from the dead. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Well, what are those mercies? That you'll be raised from the dead and rule forever and ever and ever. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. His body never decomposed. He was raised in that body. That's why, that's why Thomas, see his body never decomposed. He was raised in the body of, that he was crucified in. And it was all cleaned up. I'm sure they cleaned him up. But that's why Thomas was able to stick his hands in the side of that body. That was not his glorified body. That was a body that he was killed in. And that was the body that Thomas could stick his fingers into the, the nail prints in his hands. That he could stick his hand into his side where they plunge a spear in. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Laid on his fathers, thou shalt not see, leave my soul in hell, neither will thy suffer thine holy one to see corruption. His body did not decompose as a normal person's body would decompose. But the point of going here is this. He's the son of God. But people use the fact that he's the son of God. In two ways, he's the son of God. One, he was begotten from the dead. It's defined right here through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, by God Almighty, in that the day, this day have I begotten thee, was when he raised him from the dead. Similar in the book of Colossians, but the, let me get to the second way he's the son of God. He did not have an earthly father. He was the son of God because he was born of a virgin. That's why he was the son of God. That which was born of Mary was told, what's going to be born of you is of the Holy 
it's basically of God Almighty because it is God Almighty. So he was born of God Almighty to a virgin. He was God Almighty born in a virgin. So he's the son of God in that sense too. He had no earthly father. Why don't we go to Colossians chapter one, the same place where we read uh, in uh, verse 16, that all things are made by him and for him. There's a reference there that he was the first. And we'll read it. Let me read the passage. Colossians 1 verse 16. Why don't we start in verse 20, 14? I just can't leave this out because it's just such an amazing passage. In whom we have redemption. In whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. Well, who might that be? Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? See how he's the firstborn of every creature? So people use this. I've had this used against me or used against the word of God to show that he's not God, where they're not reading on. They don't read on. They just stop right there. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? How is he the firstborn of every creature? Well, he was the firstborn from the dead. And it says so right here that he was born from the dead. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, how is he the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. You see how he was the firstborn from the dead? That's why he's the firstborn of every creature. All these creatures are gonna be raised from the dead. It's not just human beings, it's animals. The creation. The whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the children of God because the whole creation groans and prevails in pain until now. And the whole creation is going to be free from the bondage of corruption and is going to enjoy the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's not just human beings. Verse 15, go back to verse 15. Let's get this down. Let's settle this in our hearts. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? How is he firstborn of every creature? Verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning. How is he the beginning? Was that when he somehow was created by God? Absolutely not. Because the one that was born in Bethlehem, according to Micah 5, 2, has been here from everlasting. He's always existed as God. No, he is the firstborn of every creature because he is the firstborn from the dead in verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, he's the beginning and the end in the scriptures. He's there in the beginning, he's there in the end, but he's also the beginning because he's the firstborn from the dead. I'm gonna wrap it up soon, but there's several other little things I wanted to get, they're not little things, but I, several other things that I wanted to get into. Um, bear in mind, when he is a man, he is the only one in the scripture, just like the Bible defines him as the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. So there's no way to God but through him. Even those that have never heard about him have to get to God through him. He's going to be their judge. He is everlasting life and the source of immortality. So if they get it, they're going to have to get it from him. I'm not saying that you have to know about Jesus Christ and believe in him to get eternal life. Know all those people that never heard about Jesus Christ all the way through the Old Testament and today, he is the one that's gonna judge them and he is the one that's going to have the people written in the book of life because everybody's life is expiring. We're running out of life. We're running out of life really quickly and we need new, new life. And he is the source of life because he is life and he is everlasting life. So he's the source of all life. We need it from him, and that's the way we get it from him. And he gives it to us as a gift when we believe the gospel. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
But let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 before we end. I'm actually going to I'm actually going to go to a few little passages and please indulge me by going on a little long. This is an incredible topic. You should all be charged about this topic. You should be so excited about this topic. First Timothy chapter two, verse five. For there is one God. Here's a biblical Jesus Christ. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Yes, he became a man. But he's the mediator. He's the one mediator between God and men. When he makes peace as a peacemaker, he's making peace between God and man. He's making peace between Jew and Gentile. And I'm going to talk a little bit about him being the Prince of Peace uh, later on in a little bit. But he is the mediator between God and man who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And Paul was ordained the preacher, apostle, and teacher of the gentiles for this truth well, let's take a look at um he is defined in well let's go to first timothy chapter 6 verse 15. he is the king of kings and he is the lord of lords why is he the king of kings and why is is he the lord of lords and uh why is he defined that way here verse 15 which in his time he shall shoo who is the blessed and only potentate. That means the blessed and only leader. He is the blessed and only leader. Why? He is going to rule forever and ever. He is going to be the leader. Not Donald Trump, not Joe Biden, none of these earthly leaders. They're not gonna be the leader forever and ever. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the only potentate, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is gonna rule forever and ever. That's how he's defined. If you go to Isaiah chapter uh, uh, nine, and we're gonna end here. I don't wanna go on too long, but he is the Prince of Peace. That's who he is. Why is he the Prince of Peace? Let's go to Isaiah chapter nine uh, and start at verse six. Please turn to Isaiah chapter nine uh, and start in verse six, Isaiah chapter nine. So we saw how he is the mighty God in verse six. Uh, we saw how he's all these other things, but let's start in uh, verse six. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's going to be the government forever. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of of peace why is he called the prince of peace because do you know that his government is going to have peace forever and ever peace is finally going to occur to the earth peace is finally going to occur up in the heavens all the fighting that has been brought about by the fallen and rebellious angels and by their slaves and servants the men that follow them is going to come to an end all the bitterness and anger and fighting and wars and killing, all the, the terrible things of the earth are all going to end forever. And who is going to rule? This one is going to rule, the Jesus Christ of the Bible, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. He's going to rule forever, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. There's going to be no end to peace because the Prince of Peace is gonna rule forever in perfect peace as God, as the mighty God. And his government is always gonna increase forever and ever upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom that shows you how it's associated with Israel and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. See him? That's the Jesus Christ of the Bible, ruling over the earth and the universe, ruling as the only leader and potentate forever and ever, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're going to rule with him, but he's going to be the head forever of this rulership. He's going to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever. 
and there will be no end to his government, no end to peace, no end to justice and perfection. And that's where the future of the earth is going to be and the heavens are going to be. And they're perfect. We shouldn't really care about what happens today in these stupid elections. Because forever and ever, we know who the ruler is going to be. We know who the president is going to be forever and ever. That's going to rule over everybody and everything. It's a Jesus Christ of the Bible. And his, his reign is going to be perfect. And his reign is going to be justice forever. And that's something to look forward to. The future of the earth is so bright and perfect forever. You don't have to worry about these men that mess everything up and the women that mess everything up here and the ones that mess everything up here because they're not going to be around anymore. You're going to have God himself ruling here and the righteous are going to rule forever and ever. We're going to judge the world as saints and we're going to judge angels because he's delegated that to us. But we have the Lord Jesus Christ of the scripture that will rule forever. That's it for tonight, and that's it for our two-part series about who the Jesus Christ of the Bible is. Thank you so much for joining us and learning with us.